Today I want to take you into the Bible and address some of the questions that have come in. And we're going to be focusing upon the subject of what does the Bible say about your body, your soul, and your spirit? What does the Bible say about your body, your soul, and your spirit? Now, there are many opinions on this, and there are actually denominations who have uh, various false teachings on this subject, which is why I want to take you into the Bible. And as always, we're going to start in the Bible, stay in the Bible, finish in the Bible. My opinions and denominational opinions and interpretations uh, are of no concern. What matters above all is what does the Bible say when properly read, studied, and interpreted. And I'm going to do my best to humbly walk you through that and help you to understand what is oftentimes called the triune nature of man, body, soul, spirit. And so if you have your Bible today, let's go right to the very first book of the Bible. And let's go to the second chapter, Genesis chapter 2. And let's begin reading at verse 4. Uh, I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. The Bible said, This is the account of the creation of the heavens and the earth. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, neither wild plants nor grains were growing on the earth. For the Lord God had not yet sent rain to water the earth, and there were no people to cultivate the soil. Instead, springs came up from the ground and watered all the land. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. Or some translations render that God breathed into him the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So let's begin there, and let's start with prayer and ask the Lord to guide us. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you and we thank you for the Holy Bible. And we thank you for the privilege of being able to read and to study and to learn. We thank you, Father, that you have given the Holy Spirit, whom you have called our divine teacher, our holy tutor, who guides us into all truth. And that is my prayer today, is that we would be guided into truth, and that our fingerprints and our personal biases would be washed away, and that the truth of God alone would remain. I pray for every listener. I pray most of all that they would be ready to meet the Lord. We know that we're living in the final moments of human history. We know that we are living in the last days according to Bible prophecy. And Jesus warned us in the 24th chapter of Matthew that we should be ready all the time. And so for those who may be listening, who have never made peace with God, or maybe they don't know where they stand with God, I pray that at the end of this teaching, when the opportunity is given to pray the sinner's prayer, that you would give to them the faith and the courage and the humility to turn from sin and to turn to Christ. And we'll be careful to give you the praise and the honor and the glory. For we ask it all in the mighty name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Uh, according to the book of Genesis, if we were to read on and go into the second chapter, in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, the Bible tells us that when God created man, and He created man first, we know as we read and study the account of creation in the beginning of the book of Genesis, the very first book in the Bible, the very first book in the Old Testament. Genesis means beginnings, that God first created man, and his name was Adam. And then we read a little further on that God saw that it was not good for man to be alone, and so he created out of Adam a woman, 
and her name was Eve. And so Adam and Eve became the very first couple. He created them, the Bible says, male and female. And that through their holy union, children were born. And this is how we find the beginning of the study of human nature in the Bible. And that's what we're focusing in on today. What does the Bible teach us about your body, your soul, and your spirit? And so in the account of creation and in Genesis chapter 2, we see that we are created, if you're taking notes, just write down the nature of man. And let's spend a little time filling in what the Bible has to say about the nature of man. As you're going to learn, the nature of man is very importantly connected and directly linked to the nature of God. As you'll learn today, we were created in the image of God. And so the triune nature of God is also found in the triune nature of man. But in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, we read that man is composed of two substances. And one substance is material. And that is what we call our physical body. So in creation, the physical body is a material substance created from the dust of the earth. But there's a second substance that the body also contains or the nature of man contains and that is an immaterial substance and that is your soul. God created man, breathed into him the breath of life and secondly, man became a living soul. So in the study, according to the scriptures, of understanding your body, your soul, and your spirit, you need to understand that the Bible teaches that you are made of two substances. One is material, that's your body. And the second substance is immaterial, and that is your soul. And I know many are already wondering, well, what about the spirit? Well, I am going to devote to this teaching all three of those uh, will be covered. Uh, for now, I'm just laying down the introduction of the nature of man. Uh, for those of you that are taking notes, the soul gives life to the body. The body in and of itself is not life. God created from the dust of the earth man, breathed into him the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So it is the soul nature that actually vitalizes and brings life to the physical body. The immaterial, the soul, is what brings life to the material, the body. That is why in medical science, we oftentimes read of some tragic story and a loved one, or in the news we hear of someone who is in a hospital or a, a friend, or maybe if you attend a church, you've heard a prayer request that so-and-so is in the hospital and they're on life support and the family is facing a difficult decision as to whether to continue life or to unplug and cause the exit of life. Think about that for a moment because this is going to help you. Medical science, through various means of technology and science, has the ability to keep the physical body functioning. They have medical equipment that can keep your heart beating. And as the heart is beating and blood continues to flow in the body and they continue to uh, nurture the physical body through some type of IV and feed the body and give it nutrition, they can medically and scientifically keep the body functional. There may even be some type of brain wave, but there is no life. Once the soul departs the body, all you have is a body. Very, very important. When I speak about the gold nuggets of truth, of understanding body, soul, and spirit, don't forget that. The body is not life 
without the soul. It is the soul that brings life to the physical body. Some have wrongly taught that the nature of man is a dichotomy, dichotomy referring to uh, contrasts of two. And many in various religions that I'll not mention, many of them well known, some of you may even belong to such an organization or denomination that teaches that the nature of man is just twofold, body and soul. And they teach that dichotomy principle, but as you're going to learn today, that is inerrant teaching that is wrongfully interpreted and easily shown, as I'm going to show you in just a few moments, in multiple passages of the scripture. Man is not a dichotomy, man is a trichotomy created in the image of God. And God is a trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and we'll see that in the scripture in our study today. And because we were created in the image of God, we are not a dichotomy of body and soul, we are a trichotomy. We also, in the image of God, are in three parts. We have body, we have soul, we have a spirit. And uh, keep your pen and your ability to take notes handy because I'm going to give you passages of scripture that you can read and study on your own. But today you're going to see through the Bible that it clearly teaches the triunity of man, body, soul, spirit. As I was preparing my notes, I oftentimes, when I'm editing my notes, I sit back and I ask myself a question, what if, her, what if a young child were listening to me? Am I teaching, am I preaching, am I communicating in such a way that even a child would be able to understand what I'm teaching? I know for a fact because of many that write and say that you sit down with your children and watch these broadcasts. I know of children who watch these broadcasts independently on their own. There's a young man in my home church, quite a remarkable young man. Uh, he refuses to go to children's church. And as long as I've known this young man, he has always insisted on being in the main service with the adults. And there's not one single person in my entire church that enters in and worships as sincerely as this young boy. He oftentimes will uh, escape from his mom and dad with their permission, but he'll stand in the aisle and he'll have his hands raised. And during worship, I mean, he's all in on worship. And uh, he just sent a letter in. He's a monthly partner with Lost Lamb, believe it or not. And uh, he sent his uh, one dollar uh, into this ministry. And, uh, you know, it's almost difficult to um, receive such an incredible sacrificial gift from a child. But at the same time, when I was a little boy, I remember contributing out of my own money from shoveling snow or mowing lawns and contributing to missions. And I believe that God watches those little things. It helps to form the actual spiritual destiny of children. So with that in mind, if there are young people listening, or maybe a brand new believer, you're just beginning to approach the Bible for the first time, there are a few words that I want to define for you in the beginning of this study, because as I use these words, I don't want you to get lost. I certainly am not wanting to demean the intelligence. Many of you know these words. But uh, again, for the newcomer, uh, for the child, write these words down. Because in this study, you're going to come across words like trinity, triune, T-R-I-U-N-E, triune. Uh, you've already heard me use the word trichotomy. You're going to hear me use words like triunity. And even in theology, tripartite, tripartite. And, uh, but all of them have the TRI, which gives us a clue that it means three. So in my use of those words in our Bible study today, and if you come across in your study of the scripture, and maybe you have other books and theologies that you're studying, you come across these words, just remember that it simply means the state of being three, 
one, two, three, or consisting of three parts. One of the most fundamental truths in the Bible is that God is a triune Godhead, or God is a trinity. God in three parts, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. And because we were created in His image, Genesis 1 verse 26, we also are triune in nature, body, soul, spirit. Uh, if you have your Bible, let's go into Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, and go down to verse 26. There the Bible says, Then God said, Let us make human beings in our image. Highlight the word our. To be like us. Highlight the word us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth and all the small animals that scurry along the ground. So in the very first chapter of the book of Genesis, it alludes to the tripartite nature of the Godhead. And for clarity, Jesus spoke specifically, not alluding to, but directly and specifically showing us that triune nature. Uh, I'm just going to keep you in the Bible through much of this study because I don't want anyone to go left or right or to get confused. Let's go to Matthew chapter 28. If you're a brand new Christian, that's the very first book of the Bible in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 28. And go down to verses 18 and 19. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus reveals the tripart nature of the Godhead very directly. This is oftentimes called the Great Commission. But sometimes in the study and in the emphasis of the Great Commission, we forget that hidden in that precious passage is Jesus Christ not alluding to, but specifically outlining the triune nature of the Godhead, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Uh, go over to 2 Corinthians and the 13th chapter, 2 Corinthians, and the 13th chapter, and go down to verse 14. Here the Bible says, May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So not only does the book of Genesis allude to it, not only does Jesus specifically outline it, but here the Apostle Paul, who wrote almost one-third of your New Testament, he specifically outlines the triune nature of the Godhead. He said, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And so for those of you that are taking notes, write this down, and I'll repeat it twice. Man is triune in nature because he was created in the image of a triune God. Let me say it again. Man is triune in nature because he is created in the image of a triune God. Just as God exists in the formation of what we call the Holy Trinity, man exists also in the form of a Trinity. He has a spiritual nature. You and I have a spiritual nature which is separate and very distinct 
from the physical, material body in which we dwell. Now, I'm going to give you two Bible passages now that clearly establish that man is triune in nature. What have we done thus far? What we have done thus far is we have walked you through various passages of Scripture from the beginning account of creation. We've taken you into the words of Jesus, the words of the Apostle Paul, the accounts of the New Testament, to establish the triune nature of God. So if you have proper notes, you've already documented from the Bible that God is tripartite, triune, a holy trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Now let's further establish that we, created in the image of God, are also taught in the scriptures as having this threefold contrast. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians for the first passage of scripture. 1 Thessalonians, and let's go to the fifth chapter, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and go down to verse 23, and uh, I hope you're highlighting these verses as we're teaching in your Bible, and as you continue to follow us in ministry and the various platforms of which we provide teaching. By the way, if you're new to our ministry, and uh, we're just introducing ourselves to you. Everything this ministry provides in teaching and in Bible study and in learning is all free. We have no subscription channels. We have no uh, hidden agendas financially. All of our content is available for free. Our broadcasts on Facebook Live are free. Our uh, podcast channel is free, our YouTube channel free. Everything that we walk through in this ministry is made available based upon the scripture that says, freely you have received, freely also give. So when I'm encouraging you to follow me, oftentimes I'll directly ask you, will you give me one year of your life? Give me one year of your life to sit and to hold a Bible in your hand and to allow me to be a trusted resource in teaching you the Bible and as we often teach Bible prophecy and eschatology in the end times, I sincerely but humbly ask you, allow me to be a trusted voice in teaching you the Bible because social media today is flooded with many people in the name of Christ and Christianity and ministry who are almost devoid of an understanding of what the Bible teaches. On a regular basis, I listen to things and my insides tighten and the hair on the back of my neck stands up and I'm angered that people have followings and they're not even teaching the scripture. They're teaching their opinions and their denominational creeds and what God showed them in a vision or a dream. And of course, we believe that God can speak in dreams and visions. But as you've heard me say thousands of times, the Bible is God's written voice. And everything must bow its knee to what the Bible has to say. Your dreams and revelations are not equal to what the Bible teaches. Somebody who calls themselves a ministry title, whether it's an apostle, a prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, and they're constantly telling you what God revealed to them in prayer, or what God showed them in a time of fasting, or what God revealed in a dream or a vision. None of that is co-equal to the truth of the Bible. If you learn that, you will be a mile ahead of everybody else in your understanding of walking in right relationship with God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, go down to verse 23. If you have a highlighter, highlight it. The Bible says, Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way, and here it is, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. Once again, it's the Apostle Paul who is the author 
of this first of two letters to the church at Thessalonica. That's a brand new church. Some would say mere weeks old. Some would say mere months old. But it is an infant church in the first century. And Paul writes two letters to them. And in his very first letter to these brand new followers of Christ, he is teaching them about body, soul, and spirit, just as I am teaching you today. 1 Thessalonians 5.23, Paul said, May your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. And that word and, as it is uh, rendered from the original Greek, is distinct. It is separately showing us that body, soul, spirit are individual and they are not the same. Let's go to another passage of scripture. Let's go to the book of Hebrews. And in Hebrews, let's go to the fourth chapter and down to verse 12. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 the Bible says, for the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. And of course, joint and marrow is a reference to the body. It goes on to say it exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Now, we cannot be dogmatic as to who the author of Hebrews is. This has been debated in the circles of theology and scholarship from, since it was written. And uh, we really don't know for a certainty who wrote Hebrews, but whoever the author of Hebrews was, there's even the possibility that it may have been a female. But in any case... We know that Hebrews, regardless of who wrote it, passed the test of authenticity and is a part of the canon of the New Testament and a canon of the entirety of the Bible. But Hebrews 4.12 tells us that we have a soul and a spirit, and then it refers to joint and marrow, which is talking about the physical body. This must be seriously considered before you can comprehend with any level of accuracy the subject of life after death. And let me just pause that the subject of life after death is avoided by most until it's too late. If you avoid the understanding of what happens after you die, or is there a heaven, or is there a hell, or is there eternity, or what will happen to me after my physical body reaches its expiration date? The Bible says you have been foolish. Remember, as I've already shown you and taught you, that we are comprised of two substances. The body is material and temporary. The soul and the spirit are immaterial. But the Bible clearly says that you have an eternal nature. And once you are born, you live forever. You are going to live forever. And to be blunt with you, there are only two options. You will either spend an eternity in heaven, or the Bible says you'll spend an eternity in hell. And God has not created you for hell. The Bible says in Matthew that hell was created for the devil and the fallen angels. But to make it into right relationship with God, you have to address your temporary, sinful nature and bring it into right relationship with God through choice. There are a million roads to hell, but there's only one road to heaven. And Jesus said in Matthew 7 and verse 14 that the road to heaven is straight and narrow and few there be that find it. That's why in the moments to come, I'd like to pray with you. What I've prayed with well over 600,000 people in over 56 countries of the world who have prayed and made their first time commitment to Christ. 
when I'm done in the moments ahead, we're going to pray the sinner's prayer. And as you're learning about the Bible today, if you have questions as to whether your heart is right with God, then you need to prepare yourself and say, you know what, when he prays that prayer, today's my day. Today's the day that I make peace with God. Today's the day when I quit being a know-it-all. Today is the day that I bow in humility and ask God to forgive me of all of my sins and come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. And the Bible tells me that when you turn from sin and turn to Christ, something transpires in your spirit. You're going to learn about that today when we get to that. Let's talk for a few moments about the body. If you're taking notes, number one, the body. Life is not ultimately physical. And the body is not the whole man. I want to emphasize that neither body in itself, nor the soul in itself, nor the spirit in itself makes up the whole man. But we are distinctly body, soul, and spirit. I brought to the media set today uh, a very old Bible. Uh, this was a Bible that... Uh, my mom and dad bought for me when I was probably 14, 13, 14, 15 years old. And uh, as you can see, I don't use it because it's, it's falling apart, plus it's special to me. But I keep it here uh, with me in the office and for study. And uh, this Bible is the Bible that I took uh, through Bible college. And uh, well marked in a lot of my Bible college studies and theology studies uh, are, are contained in here. It's a very special Bible to me. But this Bible was translated by a man whose name was Dr. C.I. Schofield. And uh, back in the day, this Bible would be over 50 years old now. But uh, back in the day, or close to 50 years old, I should say, I'm 62. But back in the day, a Schofield Bible was a, a cherished Bible. There weren't nearly as many translations, uh, modern translations and verbiage like we have today. But this is uh, my Schofield Bible from childhood right on through uh, Bible college. I wanted to read to you from my life notes a quote from Dr. Schofield and uh, concerning body, soul, and spirit. And in his notes, listen to what he writes. Dr. Schofield said, quote, Because man is a spirit, he is capable of God consciousness and communion with God. Because he is a soul, he has self-consciousness. Because he has a body, he has through his senses world consciousness. I like how Dr. Schofield talks about God consciousness, self-consciousness, and world consciousness. And I think that would be worth writing down. I actually think that's solid biblical gold for understanding. Let me read it to you again. Because man is a spirit, he is capable of God consciousness and of communion with God. Now, if I were to try to take this entire Bible study that we're doing today and condense it into one paragraph, this would probably be the paragraph. And so I'm sharing it with you because I think it'll help many of you in having a concise understanding. The Spirit is that part of us that has God consciousness and communion with God. Because man is spirit, he is capable of God consciousness and of communion with God. Because he is a soul, he has self-consciousness. The nature of the soul is connected to all of your self-consciousness. And then he said, because he is body, he has through his senses world consciousness. And there is no doubt that people who are outside of Christ are influenced and impacted by this ungodly 
world. Uh, if you're taking notes, this is really important. In the Bible, there are various names that are applied to the body. And so if you're taking notes, you can simply write names applied to the body in the Bible. Names applied to the body in the Bible. And uh, I'll give them to you up front, and then I'll read a few passages of Scripture uh, that will help you to find those and define those. But the Bible speaks about the body as a house. The Bible speaks about the body as a tabernacle. The Bible speaks about the body as a tent. The Bible speaks about the body as a temple. And the Bible speaks about the body as a sheath. Think in terms of a sword in a sheath. So here are five things that you'll read as you're studying your Bible that are synonymous to understanding the nature of your physical body. The Bible gives us these words in reference to the body, house, tabernacle, tent, temple, and sheath. Uh, let's go into the Bible, into 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and go down to verses 1, 2, and 3. This is an incredible passage by the Apostle Paul. Listen to it. He said, For we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, that is, when we die and leave this earthly body. Pause right there. Notice that Paul in verses 1 before I even get into verses 2 and 3, is already calling this physical body a tent. And he said, when this physical body, like a tent, is taken down, that is, when we die, he said, and leave the earthly body. Notice that he said, something leaves the earthly body. We're not just a physical body. At the moment of death, something leaves your body. That's why Paul went on to write later, to be absent from the body is to be present with Christ. The body is left behind. It's at the funeral. It's lying in the casket. It's taken to the graveside. Final words are said. It's lowered into the ground. It's buried. It's covered. It's memorialized with stone. Family come and bring flowers. But all that's there is this earthly tent. The body is left behind. Something leaves the body. We're going to get to that. For we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, that is when we die and leave this earthly body, we will have a house in heaven, an eternal body. Pause again. For those who have right relationship with God, when you leave the physical body at the moment of death, there is the hope of an eternal body. You are eternal in nature. Again, I refer you back. You were created in the image of God. And because God is triune in nature, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, you as a human being are triune in nature. You have a body, you have a soul, you have a spirit. But if you have right relationship with God, because at some time in your life, you've recognized your sinful nature, you've repented of that sinful nature, and you've received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Bible tells me that something happens in your spirit. We'll get to that in just a few moments when we transition into the teaching on the spirit. But when you have right relationship with God at the moment of death, you have an eternal body. It goes on to say, we'll have a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself and not by human hands. We grow weary in our present bodies and we long to put on our heavenly bodies like new clothing. For we will put on heavenly bodies. We will not be spirits without bodies. So here we learn from the Apostle Paul and from the Holy Scriptures that the believer, those who are right with God, when you die, 
Your spirit leaves your body, but you don't float throughout eternity on some white fluffy cloud with a harp and, and all of the cartoonish things that have been uh, crazily imparted into the minds of people. The Bible says that that spirit one day is going to be reinvented with an eternal body. The physical body was not created to withstand what eternity has. But there is an eternal body awaiting all who are right with God. So here we see uh, the references uh, to house. And of course it depends upon the translation that you're reading. But there in 2 Corinthians 5 we, we see the house, we see the tabernacle, we see the tent. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the temple and let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And go down to verses 18 through 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 18 through 20. Run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. There it is. Your body is the temple. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. A temple is a place that is consecrated by the presence of God. It is a place where the omnipresent God dwells. When God, through faith in Christ, enters into relationship with us, and we enter into relationship with God, our body becomes a temple where the presence of God dwells and abides. Frightening but glorious. When you turn from sin and turn to Christ, your body transforms from an unholy dwelling place to a holy temple. And the presence of God can abide in you. You can know the presence of God. You can feel the presence of God. You can walk in the presence of God. You can be changed by the presence of God. I also mentioned uh, the word sheath in uh, some translations of the book of Daniel. Uh, the body is described as like a sheath, which would simply give us the visual of the body being a sheath and the spirit, the eternal nature, the sword protected inside the sheath. But through the body... Your soul receives its impressions from the outer world. Through the body, your soul receives the impressions from the outer world. In other words, the impressions that we receive are received into the body through the five senses. Sight, hearing, taste, smell, touch. Through the five senses of the human body, the soul receives impressions from the outer world. By means of the brain, the soul elaborates these impressions through the processes of intellect, reason, memory, and imagination. Intellect, reason, memory, and imagination. The soul then acts upon these impressions by sending orders to various parts of your body through the brain and through the nervous system. Now, why did I take the time to explain that to you in somewhat of a, it's a biblical process, some might call it a, a medical process, but fundamentally it's, it's a God-created biblical process, because I want you to see that though we are three in nature, body, soul, and spirit, that they work, though separate, 
inseparable. They work together. When you have a right relationship with God, these three work together for harmony and production and blessing as God wanted you to be in the beginning. But when you don't have right relationship with God, the body, soul, and spirit, because they are detached from right relationship with God who longs to dwell in you as a temple, they operate through the base nature and sin and selfishness and self-destruction and failure and wrongdoing and immorality and sexual sin and so on become the outlet by which people live by the base nature of sin and flesh. Sadly, many people live as if they're a physical being only. And that's very sad because the majority, and I'm not exaggerating, the majority of people go through their entire life only living with an understanding of the body and the five senses and what I want and what I need and what I desire and what I lust after, and what I think will make me happy, and what will make me better than you, and what will promote me higher than you, and so I'll have more than you, and I'll accomplish this, and I'll attain that. And we constantly climb the ladder of self-absorption, not knowing that the last rung is eternity. And if you arrive at the last rung of life, and you've received all that the world has to offer, the physical body and the base nature and the fleshly nature, but you don't have relationship with God. Judgment awaits, and there's no way around that. Many people live all of their lives either in ignorance or willful neglect of what happens in life after death. But upon their deathbed, they suddenly realize that they've made a foolish mistake. And I've heard many people say, on my deathbed, I'll make peace with God. I'm going to live the way I want to live now, but on my deathbed, I'll, I'll make peace with God. I'm going to live my life, and I'm going to follow the pleasures of my body and what I want and what I enjoy. But I'm smart enough that on my deathbed, just before I check out, I'm going to purchase a ticket to heaven. Well, two mistakes. Mistake number one, you think that you can decide when you come to Christ. But the Bible says no one can come to Christ unless the Father draws them. You don't decide when you come to God. God decides when He gives you an invitation. The Bible says in John 15, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. You don't choose when you get right with God. God chooses when He wants to get right with you. Perhaps today. You're listening to the Bible being taught and God is choosing some of you that are listening. Today is your day to make a decision. Am I going to choose God or am I going to choose to live in the dysfunctionality of my physical body alone? The second mistake that you've made is you think you can receive God on a deathbed. Well, first, you're not in control of when you make a decision about God, God's in control of that decision. But even if you were in charge of that decision, almost everybody on a deathbed is not in a mental or spiritual condition to receive God. One of my crusades recently, I was asked to go into an ICU wing and to pray with people who were in the last moments of life. I had to put on a full hazmat suit the doctor that had invited me to come, he had seen me on a local television station and heard that I was in town with one of our Lost Lamb Crusades. He contacted the pastor who contacted me and said, there's a doctor who saw you and wanted to know if you would come and pray with some of his patients. And so I agreed to do so. I arrived and went through quite a process. I've already mentioned I went through a full a room of, of like pre-surgery and cleaning up and washing up and then a full hazmat suit and masks and, and a hood over top of the mask and a plastic shield and so on. And then I was ushered into a couple of rooms where people had, according to the doctors, moments, hours to live. I saw each of the rooms when I was there in ICU. Every single person 
was unconscious. Every single person was unable to respond. I don't know whether they heard me or not. I went into those rooms and I presented the gospel as clearly and as simply as I know how. I told the doctor, I said, I've heard it said that even though people may not be responsive by what we see on the outside, that even in some of these conditions that perhaps their brain is still functioning, they can hear even though they can't respond. He said, that's true. I said, well, if it's all right with you, I'm going to present the gospel to each one. I'm going to invite them to pray the sinner's prayer. And I did so. And it was difficult to see those bodies seemingly lifeless. The last few breaths of life, standing on the very brink of eternity, not knowing if they had ever made peace with God. All I could do was to say to the individual so-and-so by name, I don't know if you can hear me, but if you can hear me, I'm going to present the gospel to you, and then I'm going to ask you if in any way, even if you can only think this prayer, pray the sinner's prayer with me, but I have no knowledge. In eternity, I'll find out. But I walked away from that hospital with mixed feelings because I've seen many, many people who thought they were smart enough to fool God and on the way out they were going to purchase a ticket to heaven in the last moments of life. That it, but it doesn't work out that way. The vast majority of people, probably well over 80 or 90% of people in their deathbed are either in a coma, an induced coma, or under medications that they're not thinking clearly. But that's not the point. The point is you don't choose God. You don't decide the date of salvation. God said, you've not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Very, very important. The Bible says a person is a fool in Luke 12 and 21. A person is a fool who stores up earthly wealth, but does not have a right relationship with God. Are you one of those individuals, perhaps, and I'm not judging you, I love you. I love you enough to just tell you the truth. Are you one of the many, many people who are spending almost the entirety of your life and your energy working for things that are temporary, working for things for the base nature of the flesh and your desires and your wants and your dreams and your ambitions, but you've made no preparation for eternity? You've not had one intelligent conversation about God or life after death? The Bible says a person is a fool who stores up earthly wealth, but does not have a right relationship with God. I believe that's in Luke 12 and 21. Number two, the soul. The soul is the life-giving and intelligent principle that excites the human body and uses its human senses as agents. Let me say that again. Because we've talked about body, we're talking about soul. The soul is the life-giving and intelligent principle that animates or excites the human body using our bodily senses as its agents. That's why you've heard the term soul music or soul food or you know, various things using the terminology with soul as an adjective. Because it's the soul nature that uses the bodily functions and senses as its agents. It is through the nature of the soul that we seek the exploration of material things. Our bodily organs search for self-expression and communication with the outside world through the nature of the soul. Man not only has a living soul, man is a living soul. Very important. You are not only the possessor of a soul, you are a living soul. I read to you out of Genesis 2-7 that God created man out of the dust of the earth and breathed into him the breath of life and man became a living soul. The soul is the sphere of activity where Satan seeks to operate. I want to say that again, very important. The soul is the sphere of activity where Satan seeks to operate, making his appeals to your affections and to your emotions. It's the soulish nature 
that sin oftentimes attacks. The soul is the seat of passions. The soul is the seat of your feelings. The soul is the seat of your desires. And Satan is always trying to master those. A man of God of yesteryear, his name was F.W. Grant, said this, The soul is the seat of the affections, right or wrong, of love, hate, lusts, and even the appetites of the body. Uh, in Genesis chapter 4 and, and uh, verse 8, we read of a man by the name of Hamar, who said to Jacob, The soul of my son Shechem longeth for your daughter. The soul of my son Shechem longeth for, lusteth for your daughter. Of David and Jonathan, it is written in 1 Samuel chapter 18 and 1, the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. These few passages that I've just shared with you show us that the soul is the seat of our affections. But as the soul loves, it also has the capability to hate. We read in the Bible in 2 Samuel chapter 5 and verse 8 of those that were hated of David's soul. It is in the soul where fleshly lust, desires, and appetites arise. In the Bible we read in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. In Proverbs 25 and 25, the Bible says, As cold waters to a thirsty soul, so is good news from a far country. Man can never love God nor the things of God until he is born from above. He may have a troubled conscience or so be stirred emotionally or weep bitterly, but still remain dead in trespasses and sins. Man's desires and affections are torn turn towards God when he realizes his need of a Savior. The Virgin Mary said in Luke chapter 1, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. Mary, the mother of Jesus, differentiated between her soul and her spirit in the Bible. And the scripture said, my soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. So what do we learn from this? Mary, the mother of God, could not extol the Lord in her soul until she had recognized God in her spirit. You cannot have right relationship with God through your soul until you have right relationship with God in your spirit. That's why Jesus said in John chapter 3, Marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again. Your spirit must have a rebirth process. And when the spirit is born again, there is a regeneration that begins in the spirit, moves out to the soul, and affects the body. If I had a chalkboard, I would draw three rings. And the inner ring would be your spirit. The middle ring would be your soul. And the outer ring would be your body. When your spirit is born again through the repentance of sin and receiving of Christ, the spirit is made new. That's what Paul meant when he said in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17, if anyone comes to Christ, they become a brand new creature. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. You have newness, rebirth, born again in spirit. And when your spirit is born again, it then impacts the soulish nature. And the soulish nature is renewed and impacts the body. And the body then becomes the temple of the Holy Spirit. And body, soul, and spirit now work together in triune harmony for the destiny of God in your life. But you can never have that destiny until you understand this biblical teaching of the triune nature of who we are as human beings. We have a body, we have a soul, we have 
a spirit. The Hebrew word translated restoreth, when David said in Psalm 23, he restoreth my soul. The Hebrew word translated restoreth is to mean, quite literally, turns back. There has to be a time in your life when you turn to God. Lastly, and I close with this, let's talk a little bit about the spirit. In the Bible, the word spirit and soul represent two modes in which the spiritual nature operates. Your body, obviously, operates in the base nature of the flesh. But your spirit and your soul have an interaction in two modes that have spiritual connections. They're very similar. That's why there's a lot of confusion. Many times when I've heard people teach or preach, they've used soul and spirit interchangeably. Uh, number one, it helps me to know that perhaps they haven't studied the scripture on that enough to know the difference, but I don't uh, make a big deal out of it. I just want you to understand that they're two separate things, your soul and spirit, two separate things. Though separate, your spirit and your soul are separate, two distinct things. Though separate, they are inseparable. Let me make sense of that for you. Because they are so closely connected, the word spirit and soul, as I've already mentioned, are oftentimes used interchangeably. Though often used interchangeably, they are distinctly different. The word spirit, when used in the scripture, has a few meanings. If you're taking notes, be sure you get this. In the Bible, when you see the word spirit in your Bible, in an English translation, it can have various meanings. Whenever the word spirit uh, appears in the Bible with a capital S, it always refers to the third person of the Trinity or the Holy Spirit. Solid gold, that'll be on the test. Anytime you see the word spirit in your Bible and it's capitalized, capital S, it always refers to the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Trinity. Anytime you see the word spirit in the Bible with a small s, it can mean a couple of things. Very important that you take notes so that you'll not forget this. Number one, it can make direct reference to the spirit of man, but it is sometimes used with a small s and it can refer to an evil spirit or a demon spirit or an agent of the devil. The spirit of man is the sphere of activity where the Holy Spirit operates in regeneration. The Spirit receives impressions of outward and material things, as I've already taught you, through the soul. But the spiritual faculties of your spirit are faith. These are the activities of the spirit. We've already outlined the senses of, of, the, of the body, the five senses of the body. We've talked about the senses of the soul. What are the senses of the spirit man? If you want to develop spiritually, you need to know this. The impressions and faculties of the spirit are faith, hope, reverence, prayer, and worship. So if you are not operating in faith, that's why the Bible says, without faith it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. Because faith is one of the faculties of the spirit man. And how does faith come? Romans 10, 17. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, just as you're doing right now taking time in this carnal, godless world to set yourself apart, to shut down your social media, and to take time to learn and to listen to the Bible, you are strengthening and nurturing the faculties of your spirit. Faith, hope, reverence, prayer, and worship. Dr. James R. Graham says that the main theater of the Holy Spirit's activity in man and the part of man's nature with which he has peculiar affinity is the spirit of man. 
Let me read one last passage of Scripture and then we'll pray. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And let me read this passage of Scripture and then we'll pray. And in a few moments I'm going to give an opportunity for many of you to receive Christ or to make peace with God. Maybe you're backslidden and away from the Lord and need to come home. I ask you to patiently await what could make a major difference in your life today, tomorrow, and in your eternity. 1 Corinthians 2, the Apostle Paul said, let's begin at verse 9. This is what the Scriptures mean when they say, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love Him. But it was to us that God revealed these things by His Spirit. For His Spirit searches out everything and shows us God's deep secrets. Pause right there. When you have right relationship with God, God by His Spirit energizes, vitalizes, interacts with your spirit. But your spirit cannot have harmonious interaction with God and life until you have right relationship with God. Let me read on. Verse 11. No one can know a person's thoughts except that person's own spirit. And no one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. And we have received God's spirit, not the world's spirit, so we can know the wonderful things God has freely given us. When we tell you these things, we do not use words that come from human wisdom. Instead, we speak words given to us by the Spirit, using the Spirit's words to explain spiritual truths. But people who aren't spiritual can't receive these truths from God's Spirit. Pause right there. People who aren't spiritual can't receive these truths from God's Spirit. You cannot receive from God until you've repented of sin. Let's read on. People who aren't spiritual can't receive these truths from God. It all sounds foolish to them. And they can't understand it for only those who are spiritual can understand what the Spirit means. Those who are spiritual can evaluate all things, but they themselves cannot be evaluated by others. For who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to teach Him? But we understand these things, for we have the mind of Christ. Now I know that's not the easiest passage uh, to fully understand. It would deserve a full teaching in and of itself, but if I can just try to explain it briefly, what we learn from that is that your human spirit is limited to the things of man and carnality and an ungodly world. But if you want to know about the things of God, your dead and dormant spirit cannot know them until you've had a day of conversion, a day of new life, a day of repentance. The only thing that stands at the guard of the door of man's spirit is his will. I want to say that again. That's solid Bible gold. What stands between your spirit and the spirit of God? What is the door that God knocks on? What is it that perhaps was referenced in Revelation 3.20 where Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and will open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Now, of course, he was speaking to one of the churches there in the book of Revelation, but the same truth applies. God is knocking on the heart's door. How does God's spirit connect with man's spirit? You have to open the door and invite him in. Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone will hear my voice and open the door. What's the door? The door is your will. You have to willingly 
open the door, recognize your sin, repent of your sin, and receive Christ in childlike faith. Acts 4.12, the Bible says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The spirit of man is his personality, and it's what separates us from lower animal creation. Paul testified in Romans chapter 1 and verse 9, For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel. Jesus said in John chapter 4 and verse 24, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And then in Mark chapter 8, the Bible said in verses 34 through 36, then calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, don't miss this, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, the nature of the flesh, the body. If any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways. Take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, just your physical nature, your body, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and the sake of the good news, you will save it. And then perhaps the most convicting, sobering question in the Bible. Don't miss it. What do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? What do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? This has been a little longer Bible study than normal, but I really wanted to sit down in one study and at least give you a biblical outline of the triune nature of man, body, soul, spirit. Have I covered it in totality? Of course not. May we return to this subject at a later date and peel it a little deeper? We probably will. But at least, I believe, in one setting, you now have at least the fundamentals of understanding that because you were created in the image of God, which God is triune in nature, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, we outline that very carefully in the Scripture. Because you were created in the triune nature of God, you have a triune nature, body, soul, and spirit. But your spirit can never be functionally alive until you remove the curse of sin. And to do that, you've got to make a decision by opening that door. And what is that door? It is your will. It is your will. You have to willingly say, God, I know I'm a sinner. God, I know I've fallen short of your holiness. But today I want to be what you want me to be. And I want to operate in that triune nature and the harmony of what you created me to be so I can move in the favor and forgiveness and blessing of God. Would you pray that sinner's prayer with me today? God's been speaking. You have felt the tug of the Lord on your heart. Pray with me right now. Just say, Heavenly Father, today as I have listened to the Bible, you have been speaking to me. And Lord, perhaps I have been guilty of living each day with only the focus of things temporary. And I've not prepared for things eternal. Today you have showed me through the Bible that I am eternal in nature because I was created by an eternal God. And you said you long for me to have eternal life. Today I recognize my sin. And I am willing in childlike faith to repent. I turn my back on sin and I turn my heart to Jesus. I ask you to come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. I vow this day 
I will serve the Lord. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and give me the power to be what I ought to be. Keep me ready for your soon coming. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Lord Jesus. 